Professor would just say that it was a keynote speech. It is not the keynote speech. But um, actually, when this symposium was first organized, Father Greg Gaston was supposed to give the last lecture of the day, and it would have been the most appropriate pop up to a symposium like this. He was going to give us an ethereal, otherworldly talk that would just elevate all our spirits, just like Botox. <laughs> But um, his our token surgeon couldn't make it today. I am left doing the last lecture. As you heard, though, you're going to be flooded with a lot of information about Parkinson's disease because, as you've already heard from all the previous speakers, we are all passionate about what we do. And at this point, in addition to the Catholic guilt that we all carry. We are also carrying a little bit of guilt about being so far away from all of you. So if only in this venue, it is our privilege to share the work and the knowledge that we have acquired while we've been so far away and um, so far away from home. So get ready for a flood of information. This is Parkinson's disease. I was happy to hear a breakdown about um, the audience that we have here, and I am hoping that uh, yeah, relevance is it's going to be some relevance to you to hear what uh, we have to offer. Unlike my esteemed colleagues, I am for sale, so I have a lot of financial disclosures, a lot of uh, involvement in clinical trials, which is my background, experimental therapeutics, we work with industry. And in Parkinson's disease, the reason I got into the field was the people who have Parkinson's disease. As you see, there are a lot of um, quite well-known people in all uh, fields, in all walks of life, who have Parkinson's disease. And um, from the pictures that I'm showing you, it's not just a comedian, it's the comedian. Robin Williams, who died from Parkinson's disease. The world was heartbroken when he passed away a couple of years ago now. And um, it's not just like um, a boxer who was Parkinson's disease. It's the Muhammad Ali who was Parkinson's disease. And the reason why I wanted to show all of these things to you is this is the reason I went into the field. It's a Parkinson's personality that we talk about. And Parkinson's personality is someone who is usually highly successful, very motivated, always followed the straight and narrow. It was the person who never taught class. So I guess none of us are going to get Parkinson's disease. But it was the person who always followed the rules, non-smoker, non-drinker, drinks milk, does what his mommy and daddy says. But it's this high level of motivation that seems to characterize people who later on develop Parkinson's. Uh, this is a question mark because I heard a rumor that Bi Man Pacquiao may also have Parkinson's disease, or a Parkinsonism, probably pugilistic Parkinson's uh, from his boxing. So what is it? It's a neurodegenerative disorder. So it's a part of the brain that starts dying off in the substantial hydra, and this is the part of the brain that creates dopamine. So it's a dopaminergic deficiency. And the treatments that we're going to hear about, they are all dopaminergic patients. It's most commonly seen in older adults. So 65 and older, we have an incidence of 2%. If you're 40 years old, the incidence is much less. Maybe 5 to 10% of cases will be in that uh, younger group. It's generally sporadic, so it's not hereditary. Although more recently, there's been a lot of talk about the hereditary or familial form of Parkinson's disease um, because we are finding that the European Jews, the uh, uh, subpopulation in the Northeast that is fairly common, the Ashkenazi Jews have a very high incidence of hereditary Parkinson's disease. So we have to talk about the familial component of the disease at this point. Remember the pathology, this is the substantia nigra. Oh. 
So the substantia nigra, the dark and pigmented, uh, pigmented section of the brain is the most, um, it's, it's the area of the brain that creates the most dopamine for our system. So this is the area that gets sick in Parkinson's disease. So you can see a pallor in a patient with Parkinson's disease because of the dopaminergic uh, neuronal cell loss. The Lewy bodies is the pathologic hallmark of Parkinson's disease. And, oh my goodness, that is what we see. So we used to talk about dopamine. It was all about dopamine. At this point, however, research has shown us that it's much more than a dopamine deficiency. So there is cholinergic loss, there is serotonergic loss. So there are a lot of other areas of the brain that are involved in the uh, pathology that we see today. So it's not just a motor disorder anymore. Certainly, we still talk about the cardinal features of Parkinson's disease, bradykinesia, that slowness of movement, the resting tremor, which can be absent from about 25% of people. Postural instability, which usually happens much later in the course of the disease. And rigidity, which is something that you get on examination. More than this, the interest right now is the non-motor features of Parkinson's disease. So as we saw with Robin Williams, depression is a non-motor feature of Parkinson's disease that we never used to talk about. Sleep disorders as Dr. Kathy Dyer was talking about. Sleep apnea is very common in Parkinson's disease. Anxiety, autonomic dysfunction, so there's a lot of orthostatic hypertension that we have to deal with, constipation, REM sleep behavior. So now we understand that it is a whole gamut of uh, associated features that cannot be explained by the dopaminergic cell loss alone. So what do we know at this point? We know that way before the diagnosis, which happens at this point, there's already loss of those dopaminergic nerve cells that are occurring for decades prior to the onset of the disease. So at this point, a person might be completely pre-symptomatic, but they're already losing their dopaminergic cells. At this point, they actually start manifesting with the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And further, as the disease progresses, then maybe they may start with a little bit of a resting tremor, a little bit of slowness of movement, but it still takes many years before they're finally diagnosed. So the Brack hypothesis was uh, postulated by Dr. Brack in 2009, uh, in 2002. And what he's saying is that, again, decades before the uh, motor symptoms and the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, a person may have involvement of the olfactory bulb and lose his sense of smell. A few years later, they may have involvement of the vagus nerve, and there will be a lot of dysautonomia. And as the disease progresses, it's only after a little while that we may have involvement of the substantial nigra and get motor symptoms, it further develops, and we have involvement of the mesocortex, and there's bilateral disease. Further development, and there's involvement of the neocortex in some cognitive impairment. And as the disease progresses, all of these symptoms are cumulative. So a person starts out with just anosmia, loss of smell, progresses through the years, and just accumulates more and more impairments leading to the final disability of the motor symptoms and uh, balance impairment and cognitive impairment with Parkinson's disease. So in my patient population, you know, we deal with a lot of um, issues uh, as the disease progresses that we try to take care of. And it is this spectrum of uh, disabilities that we try to address in research and in clinical practice. So what's interesting is now we're trying to think, okay, so if we know this about Parkinson's disease of pathophysiology, can we actually predict who is going to develop Parkinson's disease? Maybe if we look at those early non-motor symptoms, we might be able to say, 
that person has a 10% risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So that person has a 20% risk of Parkinson's disease. So again, there's a lot of research going on trying to find early markers of Parkinson's disease. The interest being that down the road, we hope that if we find a medication that can slow down progression, we intervene this early and we might be able to prevent the disease in the future or cure the disease in the future, which is always the holy grail in medicine. So we found that hyposmia or loss of smell is present in about 90% of the patients. Constipation occurs in 60 to 80% of Parkinson's patients, again, way before they develop Parkinson's disease. So if you have no sense of smell and you're constipated, then you know you better start eating healthy, losing weight, doing all the things, and put low tops. So REM's behavior <laughs> disorder also seems to be a, a hallmark of somebody who might be with Parkinson's disease. So that's acting out your themes when you're in REM speed. And depression uh, is also fairly common. So if we, that if we uh, believe that somebody might have early symptoms of Parkinson's disease, is there anything that we can really do about it? More recently in the US, we have the uh, spec scans available, which can help make the diagnosis of a Parkinsonism. So spec scans only show that there is loss of dopamine uh, neurons, because the uh, tracer binds with the dopaminergic postsynaptic dopaminergic receptors. So if they don't have the dopamine neurons, then there's no uptake. This is a normal person with a very high uptake of tracer, and this is a person with Parkinson's disease with a much diminished uptake of tracer. So this will tell us that somebody has dopaminergic cell loss and uh, has Parkinson's disease. Perhaps, again, if we have these kinds of markers, we might be able to intervene early. So now we talk about treatment. All of the medications that I'm going to talk about today, the goal of therapy, I always tell my patients, the reason I'm here is to keep you doing the things that you love to do, the things that you need to do for as long as possible. So I take on that burden so that you can live your life. So our goal of therapy is to keep the patient functioning as well as possible for as long as possible. And we have a lot of options. So that's when you have to brace yourselves and listen to everything that I have to say. So we have a gentleman, 67 years old. He comes in with a little bit of a tremor uh, in his left hand. And he was practicing for the Hukmas Open Golf Open tomorrow. Shameless plugging all day. But uh, he was practicing for his golf game for tomorrow, and he noticed that his golf game was no longer as good. Very mild symptoms. He's 67, he's saying, well, I'm not 20 anymore. But as you examine him, you notice that there's a little bit of masking of his facial expression. You saw the resting tremor. You identified it as a resting tremor, not a postural tremor. And you did the um, uh, muscle tone testing, and it had a little bit of hot rigidity. And he was a little bit slow on rapid alternating so something happened. So you make a diagnosis, you have Parkinson's disease. What do you do? When we were in medical school, actually I think it would have been after we were in medical school. Um, because in medical school I think we were always talking about targeting the nervous treatment or uh, once we make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. But later on, a few years later, we talked about, okay, you actually have the option of not treating these patients. So you have the option of doing nothing after diagnosis. It's a, va it's a valid um, recommendation based on what we knew at that time. So at that time, we were saying, you only need to initiate treatment if there's actually a threat of his Parkinson's symptoms to his employability. If there is a threat to his uh, safety because he was a fall risk, if he couldn't handle his domestic and everyday affairs, um, and at that point, then he may recommend treatment. Because all of our treatment is symptomatic. It's not going to prevent the medication from progressing. However, more recent research suggests that this approach may no longer be appropriate. Because now we see that somebody who is not treated, this is a drug-naive patient, meaning that you chose not to treat them for 18 months, for one and a half years. Their quality of life deteriorated steadily 
over just that one and a half years versus somebody that you opted to treat in those first one and a half years who have a more stable um, quality of life. This is measured by the PD quality of life uh, screen index. And there is stability, which is clearly, doesn't have to be targeted on the Udanova, but treat them with something. In the U.S., we have 22 options for treating Parkinson's disease. Over here, I believe that you have these options, at least the drug classes that, that uh, are available there, but these are the options that we have available. So I make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. The person is devastated, but I said, you know what? I have 22 medications to treat Parkinson's disease. I only have three medications for essential tremors. And there's a lot of research going on in Parkinson's disease. Every couple of years, we have a new medication coming out. And of course, we are all working for the holy grail of finding a cure. So these are the things that I was going to talk about, just broadly in terms of drug classes. We know that levodopa is a precursor of dopamine, so it has to get into the brain in order to make the dopamine uh, available for use by the dopaminergic neurons. So levodopa going into the brain gets degraded even before it has a chance to get in there. So there are the COMT and there's the COMT enzyme and the MAO enzyme that will degrade the uh, dopamine and uh, use it up before the brain gets to use it for its other purposes. So COMT inhibitors is one drug class that we can use in order to make more dopamine available uh, by the brain. MAO inhibitors is the other drug class that uh, prevents MAOB enzymatic degradation of dopamine and allow more of that to be available for use. Dopamine agonist is the other drug class which mimics dopamine and binds with the receptors without actually having uh, the other side effects that we, we have to deal with when we talk about treating somebody with carbidopamine dopa. People who are practicing uh, internal medicine, if you are seeing older people, I think one of the things, there's one thing that we would like to share um, in terms of one of those little pearls that you can take home. We no longer, as we learned in medicine, start treatment with carbidopa levodopa on diagnosis. And I will show you why. Although carbidopa levodopa is still the gold standard of treatment for Parkinson's disease, it's still the best medication that we have, it is associated with a lot of complications. In 1992, we already saw that after only five years of levodopa treatment, 25% are still going to do well in terms of having a smooth course, but 75% are going to have motor complications, dyskinesias, toxicity, or total loss of efficacy. So this is only five years of treatment if you start carbidopa levodopa as your first drug. This was from 1992. More recently, there have been a couple of big um, clinical trials that showed us that even after two years of levodopa therapy, there's already 40% of uh, wearing off motor fluctuations that we're dealing with, 30% of dyskinesias that we're dealing with, two years. As we saw earlier from the very first speaker, uh, when Wally was talking about 100-year-old lady, uh, you know, God bless, making the sculptures and everything that they do at their older ages, we realized that if our task is to keep them functioning and doing what they love to do, we need to do a better job than give them dyskinesias and motor fluctuations after two years. So that is the reason why, if there is one thing that I would like you to remember from this talk, is that we have a lot of other options. If you do have the option of doing that, try to spare uh, the use of carbidopa levodopa until later on. So we only start with carbidopa levodopa, and again, this is not appropriate anymore. We talk about an older individual. When uh, we were in residency and fellowship, an older individual was older than 60. But nowadays, I'm thinking, well, maybe they're 70 years old. No, they still have 30 years that they can do a lot of stuff. Well, maybe 80 years old. So that, that limit keeps getting pushed up. And we have to be cognizant of that, that people are living longer. They are having productive lives. So we need to uh, stay where we've been 
that's for later on. But if they do have significant disability, then yes, maybe we need to start keeping the students possible. COMT inhibitors, as I already said earlier, blocks the COMT enzyme, and uh, there is more dopamine that's available to the brain. In the U.S., we have two, Dolcopone and Tacopone. Um, the nice thing about being able to talk in the Philippines is I am assuming that I am stripped of all of the limitations of pharma, and I can actually talk about my clinical experience. Dolcopone being a uh, COMT inhibitor that actually has greater efficacy and more convenience than Tacopone in terms of adding it onto the dopamine. It's DID dosing instead of every dose, that we have to do for a backbone, um, and it actually works very well to um, decrease the motor fluctuations of Parkinson's disease. However, post-marketing experience showed us that there were three cases of fatal hepatotoxicity, so three people died from liver failure. After that, we had to monitor patients every two weeks with their LFDs in order to make sure that our patients do not go into liver failure. Note, though, that this was something that was noted after the clinical trials were already um, completed, was not picked up in the multiple uh, randomized, well-designed clinical trials. So it was only afterwards that we realized, oh, patients can actually develop other complications that we can pick up in the clinical trials. Which is to speak to what Dr. Leo Selly was saying this morning, that we are failing in the way that we are practicing medicine and doing research at this time. So we still have a lot to learn. We have to do a better job if we're going to serve our patients well. But this is one of the examples of that. So what does a COMP inhibitor do? As you see, the uh, plasma concentration of mucodopa uh, increases with the addition of a COMP inhibitor and uh, more of that becomes available. But in addition to that, it's, it's mirrored by actual clinical outcome of improved UPDRS scores. So it's not just the uh, kinetics and the uh, bioavailability. We actually see the patients to improve. Resagiline, do you know if, could, could someone tell me if resagiline is available in the Philippines? In the US, it's marketed as Azalec. But this is a drug that's really easy to use. It's an MAO inhibitor. It's the new improved selegiline. And what we found with resagiline is that it's very well tolerated, has very few side effects. And a big study that was conducted a few years ago showed that it may slow down disease progression. So we're postulating that there may be some disease modifying effect. So we see the improvement again in the clinical trials uh, as opposed to placebo that resagiline does um, improve the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Selegiline has been around for a little while, but the limitation of selegiline is that there has been a fear that it was not as selective as they claim to be, meaning that it may not just be the MAOB enzyme that's affected, but it may also affect the MAOA enzyme, which is the one that if you're taking an MAOA inhibitor, then you can't have your blue cheese cannot have your red wine and you cannot put toyo in your food because um, there may be an interaction that will result in a hypertensive crisis. So there's a very stringent diet that you have to follow if you're uh, taking a non-selective So that is the limitation of that. The dopamine agonist. When I was in fellowship and we were doing a lot of the clinical trials for dopamine agonists, we were in love with dopamine agonists. This was going to be the answer to all of our woes. This is a long-acting drug. It's not levodopa. Um, we find that if we started as the first drug, there is decreased incidence of dyskinesias and uh, motor fluctuations later on. However, again, post-marketing experience has shown that uh, these are not devoid of side effects either. So we have three right now. Rupinerol, Pranpexol, which I believe you have. I believe you have Pyrupidil, which we do not have. But we have Rotigotine, which is a transdermal form of a dopamine agonist that actually works quite well too. So what we found with the dopamine agonist is, again, there was improvement of the UPDRS scores, meaning that it helps with the motor function of Parkinson's disease. And in the, if we compared it to Libidoba, then uh, there was a decreased incidence of the motor fluctuations and the dyskinesias. So that was a value of it. 
when I was talking about the post-marketing experience, what we found is that with these look we agonists, um, I, live, I live and work in Connecticut. We have two huge casinos very close by. And our patients were gambling compulsively. So these were people who didn't used to have a gambling, uh, did not have a disease. But with a dopamine agonist on board, we were seeing cases of people who lose their homes, lose their jobs, lose their wives, because they were doing this on the slide. And it was so easy in Connecticut. We weren't quite Vegas, but you know, there was still lots of opportunity to lose their money. They had shopping compulsions. They had sexual compulsions. And um, we soon recognized that the common denominator may be these dopamine agonists that we were treating the patients with. So now we talk about the dopamine dysregulation syndrome, impulse control disorders that can occur with dopamine agonists. So we have to be careful when we make these dopamine stones as well. I believe that with Peripadil, that has been reported too. So if that is your other drug, Pramipetzol certainly has been uh, reported to be associated with uh, impulse control disorders, but Peripadil has been as well. So mantidine, really old drug. The only thing I want to say about the mantidine is its greatest use is for dyskinesia. So it's not really very useful for the symptom treatment, like uh, maybe a little bit for tremors, but not so much for brain amnesia and rigidity, but it is very useful for dyskinesia. Anticholinergics, another ancient, helpful maybe if a person is younger, and maybe somebody with tremor predominant Parkinson's disease, but a very dirty drug. So you're dealing with a lot of neuropsychiatric side effects, hallucinations. Hallucinations for people who have seen people with Parkinson's disease. Quite complex, quite impressive to hear about the hallucinations that they would develop. They talk about serving dinner because there are three people in the dining room with them that they serve dinner to. The most complex visual hallucination that I heard about was a medieval joust right in the backyard. So they can have quite, quite complex formed hallucinations inside, not preserved. And the first thing you need to get rid of is your anticholinergic. So um, there are certain medications in our armamentarium that are a little bit more notorious than others for causing these kinds of problems. So after five years, our 67-year-old gentleman is now 72. I was making my slides yesterday. You have to guess how long it took me to do that month. I was 67, five years later. Sleep and drive three days, of like 72. So he's now 72 years old, and I opted to treat him with a sagittal, and he was on a dopamine agonist. I was considering him to be younger. He did very well for the first four years, but at this point, both hands were shaking. His, uh, the Parkinson's has developed a little further. Um, he has more significant brain condition. He has rigidity bilaterally at this point. So Parkinson's usually starts on one side. Eventually, everybody will develop it bilaterally. His gait was a little bit more shuffling, and he had impairment of balance. So this is key in terms of uh, deciding you need to go to the next level of treatment at this point. So when the progression of disability is such that it is a threat to his safety, then you really need to do more for that patient. And for this patient, I started Garmin Open with Oprah, 25, 100 times a day, and he did very well for another five years. So now, five, he's 72, he is now 77 years old and he had further development of disability. So this is the point when he's developing the motor complications that I kept talking about earlier on. What that means is that they take the medication, particularly carbidopa levodopa, they feel good uh, for the duration of time that the levodopa is working. But initially after six, six hours maybe, they start feeling it wear off. So it kicks in, they do well, they don't have symptoms of the Parkinson's disease, but it doesn't last very long, they start to wear off. So that's what I was referring to when I was talking about motor complications and motor fluctuations. After a few more years, it may not last six 
hours, it may only be four hours, and then three hours, and then two hours. Can you imagine if you were only on, meaning that you could only move for eight hours of your day? So you're here working from, you know, seven in the morning till uh, 11 at night. Can somebody help me with the math? Because that is not going to happen. Seven in the morning to 11 at night is whatever hours that is. So you have to be able to walk for that period of time. You have to be able to move. You have to be able to write. People with Parkinson's disease lose their ability to write. So they tell me about having to make out their Christmas cards before appropriate treatment and how they have to time that for the period of time that their medication is working. So they'll tell me, you know, I have 50 cards that I need to write. I'm trying to write all of it in my first two hours of the day because it's the only time that I'm on. The rest of the time, they can't write. The rest of the time, they can't move. The rest of the time, they go into McDonald's thinking that they can grab a quick hamburger. And while they're there, they wear off and they can't get back out. It's that much of a fluctuation that we see in these patients at this stage of the disease. So we have to do a better job. We need to be able to keep our patients on for as long as possible during the day. We need to find a combination of medication that is going to diminish the motor fluctuations. So that is the onset and the off-state, and that is the challenge of Parkinson's disease treatment in the advanced stages. In addition to the motor impairment, however, we're going back again to the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So we have patients who would tell me, you know, every so often during the day, I go into a panic. It's like I'm breathing hard, I get abdominal pain, I'm sweating, and I can't move. So now we know that in addition to the inability that occurs when people wear off, there's also a lot of these non-motor symptoms of anxiety, drenching sweats, abdominal pain, cognitive clouding, that also become very disabling, very debilitating for them. And in fact, 28% of patients say that these symptoms are more disabling to them than their motor symptoms when they wear off. And these are the patients who go into it anxiety attacks, panic attacks, they're the ones who become what we call levodopa junkies. So to avoid going into that state, they're popping their their cinnamon, their carbidopa levodopa every hour, and they're dyskinetic because they're getting too much of the um, of the levodopa in their system. But they don't want to go into that not in the, that off state because it's just very um, overwhelming. So, what do we do? You have somebody who is wearing off or who doesn't quite go on. The simplest thing to do is adjust how you're going to make levodopa. The way to figure out how to adjust your levodopa is you have to figure out, is it a matter of duration or is it a matter of optimal efficacy? So if a person takes the levodopa and they actually do well for the three hours that it's working, don't increase the dose of levodopa. Increasing the dose of levodopa is not going to make it last longer. What you need to do is bring the interval shorter. So instead of giving it every six hours, you give it every five hours, or four hours, or three hours, depending on the interval of time that it will last. However, if your patient says, I take my levodopa, doesn't really do anything, I'm still slow, I'm still struggling, then at that point, you can actually increase from 100 to 25, 100 um, dose to maybe 25, 150 and then half tablets each time. So that's the simplest thing that we can do in the setting of somebody who's on the Lodopa. Or you can use one of the other 21 medications that we have available to try to minimize the motor fluctuations. So add a dopamine agonist, add a COMP inhibitor, add rosagitin or an MAOB inhibitor. And all of these medications can also prolong the life of levodopa so that they're not going into those motor fluctuations. Brand new fresh off the press. 
Thank you very much for joining us for seeing 